G'day viewers. Well, we've got some exciting videos coming up now. Um, we're going to be looking at some antique swords. Uh, this first video, we're going to be comparing three broadswords, three military swords, a Highland Claymore, a Ski of Honor, and a Spanish Bilbo. Um, and I'm going to be joined by my friend Dan, who is a, uh, a much more expert antique arms collector. Um, and has a lot more of them than I do. So we're going to be discussing the features of the swords um, and generally what we think of them. So the first sword we're going to look at is this one. This is a Highland Broadsword circa 1650. Um, it is pretty substantial. It weighs about 1.4 kilos, um, 32 inch blade from the cross. and nice protective basket, just big enough for a fairly simple hammer grip. And it's obviously designed for cutting. This sword wants to swing and it does that very, very nicely. As you can see, the blade is extremely thin up at the business end of it. Uh, Dan, is there anything you want to add? Um, you may not be able to see in the light, we've got a, a Passau sort of mark here, which suggests probably made in, in Germany. I mean, the, if it's the true Passau mark, it's made in the city of Passau in Germany, um, which was pretty common. Uh, we know a lot of the Scottish sort of clan blades were made in Germany, imported, and then hilted in country. Yes, and this looks very much like it's a, it's a, it's a village blacksmith. So yeah. this is probably hilted in the Highlands themselves. Mm. And very sort of a, a very common form for the time. You don't see, um, the sort of you've got the round very round sort of spherical shape which you don't see on a lot of the later baskets they sort of flatten out in various yeah. different areas and if you look at these sort of so-called sword catchers they're actually really shallow all they're doing is serving to just protect that thumb so if you want to stick that thumb up in the curve yes yeah, so about, we've talked about the collins curve there it is and it allows me to stick my thumb there which allows me to actually get the point more or less on line so if i want to thrust I can extend my thumb into the curve and that allows me to present the point. So uh, yeah, you can't do that in a basket of this side unless you've got the curve for your thumb there. Yeah, and we're not breaking any new ground here when we suggest that these cur these sort of sword catches at the front here are for anything but sword catching catches, swords because yes. it's very unhelpful to do that. <laughs> yes. And very annoying when they actually get caught in there. Yeah. I hate the things. Yeah. It's, so. it's a great idea until you do it. Yeah. So this is really, a, you know, the difference between this and a medieval sword is really just the hilt. Um, it's otherwise gripped in exactly the same way, and this just replaces the gauntlet. Um, and otherwise it is a broad, heavy cutting blade designed for cleaving people apart on the battlefield. Ah, there is one other interesting thing, which is if we look at the pommel here, you've got this globular kind of pommel, as Paul said, very sort of medieval into the sort of Renaissance period, but it's fixed, the hilt is actually fixed to it with a pin that goes into the pommel, is hammered in there, which you don't see later. They move to a ring uh, and the pommel actually slides into and locks the whole guard in place. Whereas these bars back here are actually just floating. They're kind of just pressing very lightly against that pommel there. Yeah. Anyway, so let's move on to the next sword, which is similar but different. This is our next sword. Uh, it's a Venetian Schiavonum, uh, same period, it's from the 1650s. But as you can see, the basket is a lot more complex. It's a lot more sort of developed, we might say. Um, these are very, very complicated to make. They actually start with a bundle coming out from the cross in there and they bend all the bars down individually and then they add separate plates. It's a lot. Yeah, it's more, a lot of work. A lot of work, a lot more labor intensive. The blade, again, is very, very thin. Very, very similar to the clan broadsword that yeah. we just looked at. And it's longer. This one is 35 inches long, so that's significantly on longer. It's also significantly lighter. This is only mm -hmm. 1.2 kilos. And it moves very nicely. Um, you can see that the point is a little bit sort of pointier. finer there. It's yeah. much, yeah, the thrust. It is the thrust is certainly given a little bit more precedence, although this will cut very, very nicely. Um, it's got that sort of fishtail pommel there, which sits very nicely into the hand if you hold it in a bit more of a handshake grip, uh, rather than sort of a straight hammer fist as you might with a... Yes, and it's got a thumb ring. Mm. 
which I don't know how well you'll be able to see. There you go. And the thumb ring, the, the difference with this thumb ring as opposed to a lot of modern replicas of thumb rings is it actually locks behind, there you go, that's the thumb ring there. It locks behind that knuckle of your thumb there, the first knuckle, and you actually sort of pull with the knuckle. You can feel it sort of pull against it rather than actually gripping it and sort of pulling up, yeah. which is a bit different. Now, people call these Italian because they're from Italy, but yeah. who actually used them? So, from what we kind of know that uh, we think the the style itself was sort of brought uh, of the sort of broader cutting braids was brought into the Venetian states by Dalmatian mercenaries, so coming from that sort of uh, further up sort of Slavic regions, uh, and they were fighting the Turks a lot of the time. So having okay. a, a very thin, delicate rapier is really great until you've got some guy with a, a buckler and a, a shamshir yeah, or yeah, something yeah. like that. Suddenly it, you need something a bit heavier. So the, we know that the Dalmatian sort of mercenaries really liked this style of sword. Uh, these get more and more complex and they become quite popular. We even know that one of the Scottish lords... Oh, uh, they're, they're, you get quite bought, a few of these in Scotland. Yeah. The Scots quite appreciated them. They thought they were cool. Yeah. Um, there is a little mark on here down there, right down the bottom of the blade there. There's a one on the other side. Uh, that, as far as my research has turned up, suggests that the blade is from northern Italy. That's all I've got, somewhere in yeah. northern Italy. Um, there's a little hook at the bottom here. Sometimes, you can see that there, sits on the pommel like that. Sometimes there's a ring that comes out of the pommel to connect to that. This may be rehilted at some point, or they may have just added it and never put a ring yeah. on. It's also worth pointing out, the pommel is not very big. It's, it's smaller than the broadsword pommel and much lighter. Mm. Um, it does very little to balance, sort of counterbalance the sword. So that wants, again, it's balanced as a cutting sword. It wants to swing. Um, do you like the thumb rings? I like them on this. <laughs> I've, I've never liked them on anything else. Um, I held a Walloon cavalry sword the other day with a thumb ring that was clearly designed so you could put uh, a gauntlet in it, and it was atrocious. It just right. may not have, like, you shouldn't have had it on there. Yeah. This, I find, makes the sword very responsive. Yes, it does give you a, mm. a really good extra point of leverage to move it around, which you can't do with the hammer grip. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I prefer thumb, thumb rings to fingering the cross yes. is because with a thumb ring I can still do that. Um, and as a left-hander, that's important. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you could finger the cross in this sword. Although but you really don't want to. Yeah, the shape of the cross And suggests. it's it's sharp. It's yeah. sharp there. If you stuck your finger over the cross, you'd cut yourself. So it's not designed for that. Um, and after the last video featuring this sword, uh, we found out that some Ski of Honours do allow you to finger the cross, but for the most part, they're thumb rings. So that's why I think it's like Italians like to finger the cross mm. with pretty well everything. Um, so, and it suggests to me that the ones that you can finger the cross with are yeah. probably ones that were made for, for Italians, Italians, precisely not for Dalmatians. Exactly. So the 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 thumb ring is a much more northern European thing. Mm. Um, all right, let's have a look at the third, the new sword, the newest one. So, what do we have here? So this is a Spanish Bilbo. Bilbo, um, Bilbo bag. They sometimes get sort of lumped into being just cavalry swords. From what I've managed to turn up, that's not the case. They're no. used on foot and on, on horse. They're, this style, so you can see pretty clearly that a rapier is kind of the, is where they're getting the idea from. Although they seem to pop up a lot in colonial Spanish areas. So a lot in the New World yeah. in sort of South America and things like that. And that makes sense that you yes. want a heavier cutting blade when you're fighting people with very large clubs yes. and things Obsidian like that. Obsidian swords. So again, you can see the the blade wobbles. So it's a very a very thin cutting blade, like the broadsword. Lighter. This is also one point two kilos. Longer. Also, okay. So it's thirty five inches from there, but you've got quite a long ricasso behind the thing there. So even once you've stuck your finger over there, you're getting an extra inch or so of grip mm. between your hand and the thing that you're hitting. Yeah, it's pretty roomy. The hilt is pretty roomy. Um, yeah, it is. You could definitely get a gauntleted hand in there. Which, I, yeah, we imagine is probably the case. Uh, with the other two, you're not putting a gauntlet in there. You simply yeah. won't get it into the, into yeah, the hilt. Yeah, so it is quite roomy. Um, and again, a fairly small pommel. Yeah, very small. considered. 
Very it's small. still, it's still, it's forward weighted. It wants to cut and it wants to swing. Mm. Um, One thing we didn't talk about. Yeah. Uh, so the Bilbo and the Ski of Honor are handed. They're specific for a right-handed person. That's the way they're designed. And the broadsword is not. That no. is, some broadswords are asymmetrical. But this one is entirely symmetrical. I can pick that up equally in left or right hand, which is a good idea mm. as far as I'm concerned. Well, yeah, so this one you can see the shell on the right hand side, on the outside line for a right hander is bigger than the inside line. Um, again, it's, it's, you could hold it out and sort of do distressery things with it for as long as you really want. It's not overly heavy. No, not at all. It um, sits there quite nicely. And it would hit like a freight train if you, if you <laughs> swung it at someone. Yes. Um, this has a mark on it. I cannot tell what it is. Because it is too corroded. It's a corroded. tiny sort of splodge there-ish, yeah. yeah. Um, it's had a horrible coat of, I assume, some form of varnish at some point, which yeah. uh, I'll leave it to the next owner to figure <laughs> To deal out. with. Um, but it's, yeah, it's a very interesting sort of comparison to how three different places solve this issue of I need a broad cut and thrust sort of weapon. Yeah. Um, now, I have... Or I, I, in a castle somewhere in England, on one of my trips, I came across a sword which was obviously Grandad's arming sword, big medieval cross hilt thing, which somebody had updated by having essentially a Bilbo hilt built around the existing sword. Mm. Um, I had a, a reproduction of it made, um, which turned out much nicer than the real thing. The real thing did really look like... You know, it was it was banged together in somebody's shed, which of course it was. Um, so, and Hounslow, the swordsmiths in Hounslow Heath, also made these sorts of Bilbo-ish hilts on a fairly regular basis. Mm. And of course, the Scottish clam guard claymores, two-handed swords. Um, were just massive versions of this sort of Bilbo hilt. Yeah, the Spanish by no means were the only people doing this. They just kind of the people who continue doing it the longest. Yeah. They didn't really change this style. I think slightly before the Napoleonic Wars, they moved to a new model of sword. Other than that, this kind of model of sword is still around. Um, and, so it obviously worked. And it, yeah, it worked very well. It also was not uncommon, especially in Spain. I've owned a sec another one of these Bilbos, and it had a, a blade from the late 1500s on it. They typically rehilted family blades quite a lot, by the yeah. same, sounds of yeah. Well, why are you going to waste a good, jolly good steel sword? So, yes, just update it. Exactly. Don't make it like they used to. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, cool. So... Of the three, which do you like best um, to fight with? I've been doing Scottish Broadsword for 10 years, so probably yeah. the Scottish Broadsword. Um, the Ski of Honour, though, is probably a very, very close second for me. It's very nice in the hand. It cuts, it thrusts. It's a, I think it's a very, very well-designed sword. Um, the Bilbo, it's a nice sword, but it's, it's quite weighty and it, it's quite slow in the cuts. If you hit somebody with it, they're not okay. getting back up but you can't sort of really move it around super fast and super nimbly. Well, yeah, I mean, if you've got the sort of the finger over the cross that allows you to do the up-down thing. Yeah. Um, but you certainly can't turn it sideways in the, with as, as much ease as no. you can the thumb ring. Um, and the other thing about fingering the cross is this becomes extremely unpleasant. Um, you can't really do that with your finger over the cross in any sensible way. So you kind of lose the inside hanging guard there so yeah i agree this comes third yeah all right well there you are thank you so that is a little review of three historical broadswords i guess you could call them cut and thrust swords mostly cutting um i hope you enjoyed <laughs>